Hi, I'm Carla Rieger, and I wanted to talk about the Tavis Avara aptitudes that feature in the novel Heliotropus. In particular, about the five main aptitudes of tangent, accrevent, voyant, audient, and sentient, or Tavis for short. This is a system to identify your extrasensory and sensory strengths and weaknesses. There's a quick quiz you can do to find out your dominant style. Just go to goldenagetimeline.com backslash free or go to the free tab and you'll see the quiz there. Today I'll give you more background on the styles and you might be able to tell your dominant style just by listening. So in the novel, there is this fourth density world of Heliotropus in Inner Earth. The people there have aptitudes, which might also be referred to as superpowers. In other words, humans have them, but many of these powers are latent, unused. But people can dial up on these kinds of skills just through being more aware of them and through focusing their mind on using their dominant style to manifest goals. You might be asking, what exactly is a manifestation style? So the Tavis profiling system is about assessing how you best create goals and envision dreams into reality. But it's also tied into how you behave, speak, learn, and how you perceive the world, as in regular sensory perception and extrasensory perception, because your senses are what help you manifest goals. So that's what we'll look at today is how can you be a better manifester by really building up your dominant strength and building up your other more latent skills. For example, you can use the Tavis system to better manifest anything from a parking space when you're out shopping or a new successful business or even a new way of looking at your life that's more empowering, or of course the quality of a relationship you're in or the brilliance level with which you do your work, all the way up to co-creating or co-manifesting the world you really wanna see for yourself and others. You know, one perhaps where people are free, living in harmony, prosperous, healthy, doing what they love, where the earth is whole, balanced and healthy again. And the more we all see, feel, hear, and experience what we want through our imaginations, the more it comes into being. Even if just one person is doing it, it affects the whole collective. Now, the truth is it's your imagination and intention that bring things into reality. But many of us were taught to think that imagination is something bad, like getting lost in delusions, not grounded in reality or that imagination is something you only use when you're a child and that you must grow out of when you get older, if you want to be taken seriously as an adult. But your imagination and intention are two of the most powerful tools you own in your mental, emotional, and physical landscape. So don't ever forget that and use them with wisdom where they can work against you. So these five Tavis manifestation styles are like the box of tools or maybe palette of colors you use when playing around in the world of imagination and intention. And we use them anyways. (laughs) So this is just creating a system so that you can, you know, name and identify and become more comfortable and familiar with these latent abilities that we all have. So I'll briefly go through the five styles and see if you can recognize your dominant style. Although in truth, many of us are a blend of two, three, or even four styles, but we usually have one that stands out. So here it goes. The tangent manifester. So in terms of activities, you'll often see a tangent being physically active or restless, especially if they have to sit still for too long. So when it comes to the words they use, they might start a sentence with, I feel, I feel good about that. Or I feel we need to do something different in this situation. 
Or they might say, the thought of that makes me feel good, or I have a bad gut instinct about this. So think about whether you use words in that way. Greetings, they'll tend to do a more informal physical greeting like a high five, a back slap, or a fist bump. (laughs) They like physicality. They're not one of those standoffish kind of people. So the best way for tangents to learn is by moving. They aren't one for sitting at a desk for too long. They need to move to think properly. They get their best ideas when walking, running, moving around the house, or by doing activities. They prefer to learn a subject by doing a project, like creating a garden to learn about plants rather than reading about plants in a book. So in terms of the advantages of the regular sensory perceptions of tangents, they're good with their hands. They are grounded, reliable, salt of the earth types, you know, stable, honorable, connected to nature. Now the disadvantages in extreme types that aren't balanced by the other styles is they might be very physically restless. They might even get physically aggressive if challenged and they can be stubborn and uncompromising. But now say you were to develop your tangent aptitude beyond the everyday normal into what's called extrasensory perception. And there are a few people who can do these kinds of things. And as I said, there's a theory that we can all develop these regular sensory skills into the extrasensory realms, which are latent capacities within all human beings. So with tangents, it's called clairtangency. So they can handle an object to get information not available to the five senses. For example, sometimes a clairtangent is used in detective work or a missing person situation where they would touch an article of clothing to help locate the person. Or they can do psychometry where they can actually move objects with their mind or manipulate an object with their mind. I mean, you may have heard of people who can bend a spoon with their mind. So the best way for tangents to manifest is if they imagine being somewhere physically. So say you want to manifest a trip to Hawaii. You might feel yourself walking along the beach, feel the warm sun on your skin, feel how relaxed you are lying in a hammock, and move while you imagine. So you might go for a walk or run or do Tai Chi or yoga while listening to say to an audio to help prompt your imagination as this will help your subconscious mind integrate your instructions about what to create and types of professions where you might find a lot of people who are a tangent are athlete, athletic coach, Clothes maker, gardener, waiter, logger, miner, farmer. (laughs) So people who like to move while they work. You might also see those types who have like a treadmill at their desk (laughs) are often tangents. Now in the novel Heliotropus, the character of Cassandra is a tangent. She's got a certain nuance of that aptitude called the soul healer and therefore can heal physical issues in people by accessing soul records to bring cells back to optimal functioning again. And of course, each character has their flaws, and in her case, she can physically harm others with her mind. And that's what Claire Tangents can do if they're using their aptitude, their superpower for negative purposes. Although in some cases, it helps to use that kind of power if you need to, say, protect yourself. Let's look at a Crevent. They are often seen quietly studying, reading, or writing. They will often use words like, I know a lot in conversations. I know about that, or I know I will enjoy that. They prefer a more formal non-touch greeting, as opposed to the tangent, where you might see them do a head nod (laughs) rather than a physical greeting. So the best way for an accrevent to learn is by reading. They like researching and studying on or offline. They go in depth to find gems of knowledge and they get their best ideas when uninterrupted in a quiet place. 
They also learn best by writing. So think about that for yourself. You know, they like to journal or in a learning situation, they'll take lots of notes. You know, those people who are note takers and there's other people who don't take notes. And they like to organize their notes and have good systems for this. Now, the regular sensory perception advantages of the accretion are there intelligent, thoughtful, philosophical, a great use of written language, and will do their due diligence before making a decision. In other words, they are thoughtful and methodical rather than spontaneous and fiery. Disadvantages in extreme types that are unbalanced with the other styles is they might be too introverted, kind of antisocial, disconnected from life, can be lost in their heads, and inattentive to details. You know, the archetype of the Einstein with the wild hair and the stacks of books and papers everywhere. And say you were to build your extra sensory perception as an accretent, it might be around doing automatic writing, or some people call it channeled writing, where they're bringing in messages from their higher self or a higher source, and just their hand does the writing and it comes out on a page and they have no idea what they're going to write. They also tend to see code behind the matrix. <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie, The Matrix, where regular people actually live in a virtual reality type world and those out of the matrix can see the code that is created to make that world. So that's what accretions are quite good at if they build up that skill. And you could also think of their extrasensory perception as clear cognizance, the ability to just know information or read records. You know, people talk about the Akashic records of a soul where you can go into these big <laughs> crystal halls of wisdom on life and know things about people or situations without actually physically seeing anything. And the best way to manifest as an accretion is to write about your goal or vision that you want to manifest. So if you want to manifest a vacation in Hawaii, say you'd write about being there in detail and you'd read about Hawaii to fill your mind with the details of the place and then write out your goal in specific details about where you'll go, what you'll do, that kind of thing. Now, the types of professions where you see lots of accretions might be librarian, editor, journalist, researcher, writer, systems analyst, copywriter, computer hacker, <laughs> reviewer, as in a movie reviewer, written translator, that kind of thing. And in the novel Heliotropus, the character of Meta is... And Akriven, she's an amazing poet, a master of words, but the downside is that she can also use words to keep people lost in regret or distrust. Stavron is an Akriven as well, and his nuance makes him the mind coder. He can help rewrite mind code in people to empower or disempower the person. Now, I know that seems way out there, but some people do see patterns in how other people think and how computer codes work. You know, the hackers of the world, they kind of grok the language of a brain or an operating system far better than others. And you may not realize you're doing this, but it's like you just know the truth of someone or something, and that's you reading deeper levels of code. It's the idea that behind the illusory reality we live in, there's a sacred geometry code symbols and it's available to us to translate that into something meaningful for our day-to-day -day lives. Now let's look at voyant. How to recognize a voyant? Well, they may dress very well, nicely put together. Everything matches, often seen watching movies, looking at images, drawing images, diagrams, observing the visual details of a place, person, or thing. And they might use the words, I see a lot in conversations like, oh, I see what you mean, or see you later, or I can picture that. Greetings are more formal, like the accretion, maybe a handshake, but with direct eye contact. 
depending on their cultural background. Now, the best way for a voyant to learn is by seeing images. They appreciate, say, videos with lots of images or slideshows with images, symbols, diagrams, colors. They may like to draw or use symbols for note taking. They might be the types to use mind maps, for example, or they might doodle a lot. <laughs> if you're one of those people who doodled in class when you were <laughs> trying to learn, that might be you being a voyant. So the regular sensory perceptions for voyants in terms of advantages are that they might have a high aesthetic intelligence. You know, their homes are beautifully put together, the way they dress, they're well-groomed, they like visual harmony. They're very visually perceptive. They'll notice visual details that other people won't. They have a vivid visual imagination. They have a good sense of direction if they've seen a visual map and a good facial recognition. They'll often remember visual details in a way other people won't. Disadvantages in extreme types might be overly perfectionistic about their appearance or the way their home or garden looks, and they might come across to others as too cold and insensitive, lacking empathy for others. In terms of extrasensory perception, well, you've probably heard the term clairvoyance. So they might have a very active dream life where they can perceive events in the future or beyond normal sensory contact through an image in their mind's eye or through prophetic dreams. Or if you've ever seen those movies where someone's looking into a crystal ball or a ghost walks into a room and they can see the ghost, you know, somebody else might just sense the ghost or hear the ghost, but they will actually see the person and can describe them visually. And you know, the person they're talking to can confirm whether that's how the person looked or not. And they'll be maybe employed as remote viewers. If you saw the movie Men Who Stare at Goats <laughs> with George Clooney, it was all about these people who are employed by military intelligence to all sit in separate rooms with the same target and see if they can see what's happening on the other side of enemy lines to put them at a greater advantage over their enemy. And then all the people will come back together and triangulate what they saw and take the overlap and use it <laughs> to their advantage. It's been going on for a long time. And in fact, you can look in ancient cultures and you know, there's oracles and prophets who have all these Tavis abilities and were always used by the leaders or anyone wanting an advantage over others in regular life. So of course, all of these skills can be used for nefarious means, but they can also be used in a good way. So if you start to think, oh, all of this is witchcraft, it's all your intention and how you use it. There's black magic, there's white magic, there's gray magic, which is sort of somewhere in between. It's all about your intention. That's why I said imagination and intention is everything. So if you have an intention to serve good purposes, to really serve people, serve the highest good for all concerned, then you're using white magic and it's a good thing and we should all have access to this because otherwise people will use black magic against you either consciously or subconsciously. So you can protect yourself with these skills against people who know how to use it and might have a bad intention. So the best way to manifest if you are a voyant is imagine being somewhere visually. Like if you want to manifest a trip to Hawaii, imagine the sights, <laughs> like the beautiful sunset with the palm trees, the big surf. Maybe you draw a picture or create a vision board to keep you visually focused on Hawaii. And then what happens is you start to, by default, create whatever is necessary to get you there. Now types of professions with lots of voyance, well, painter, interior designer, graphic designer, photographer, videographer, cinematographer, fashion expert, anything where the visual is really important. So in the novel Heliotropus, the characters of Haddon and Daphne are both voyant and they are both clairvoyant. 
Haddon, for example, has a photographic memory, so he can recreate the whole amethyst device because he saw the blueprints as a child and he can remember as an adult how to recreate it. And they can both do remote viewing and his nuance is the eagle eye whereby he can understand the bigger picture or the vast landscape of what's going on in the world. Daphne is good at creating visual illusions. Her nuance is the magician and that is why she ended up involved in modeling, acting and aesthetics and later creating the cloaking of a starship. So visual illusions. So now let's look at audience. So they're often heard humming, talking to themselves, listening to music or audio books or podcasts or observing audio nuances, picking up on sounds that other people don't pick up on. And words they'll use a lot are, I hear, I hear what you're saying, or I hear that's going to be a great event, or that sounds good to me, or talk to you later as opposed to see you later. And greetings are usually verbal, like, hi, how's it going? <laughs> they wouldn't just do a silent head nod, right? They would say something. And the best way for audience to learn are hearing the information as opposed to reading the information. So they might need to read out loud or listen to books on audio for them to retain the information. And they also learn best by, say, studying with a friend so they can talk about the information they're learning. They come to conclusions about things by talking it through. Regular sensory perception, the advantages of audience are they tend to be musical, social, not necessarily always in big groups, but they like to talk and listen. They like to be in conversations and they retain more information than other styles through the spoken word. And they also tend to be the type of people that are good at multitasking. <laughs> so advantages in extreme types is they may be too easily distracted, <laughs> you know, shiny object syndrome, and maybe too talkative. Say you're trying to teach them and they just want to always interrupt you. And they can have fiery personalities, which can be great, like passionate, but sometimes a bit too intense for others. And extrasensory perception, you've probably heard the term clairaudience or being a clairaudient. So they can hear voices, words, sounds, or music that are not audible to the normal ear. So if they were a psychic, they would hear the loved one of their client giving them a message. They wouldn't necessarily see them. And the best way for an audient to manifest are to imagine hearing sounds of what they want to manifest. So say you wanted to manifest this trip to Hawaii, you would imagine the sounds of the surf, the waves, hearing the tropical birds, hearing maybe the Hawaiian ukulele, <laughs> the music there, or you might create an audio to prompt your imagination, like listening to yourself in a recording or you might have a hypnotherapist create an audio for you talking about Hawaii and all its detail. So imagining yourself there through sound. And types of professions where you might find lots of audience are, of course, musicians, sound tech people, speech pathologists, radio personalities, DJs, podcasters, orators, that kind of thing. So think about that for yourself. Are you? a dominant audience. So in Heliotropus, Annika, the genius musician, is an audience, and so is Xander, also a musician. They're both larger than life characters with big personalities, but they can also end up alienating others by their excessive ways. So lastly is sentient. So how to recognize a sentient? Well, they're often involved in social causes, anything involving caring for others. They're friendly, they're emotionally engaging. They'll use words like I sense in conversation, or they might sign off on an email or a text by writing take care. Now greetings would be a more informal hug, a gentle hand squeeze, arm around the shoulder, that kind of thing. They're very 
emotionally demonstrative. And the best way for a sentient to learn is by feeling emotionally engaged. So we just want to differentiate the tangent, which is physical feelings, and the sentient, which is emotional feelings. So in a learning situation, they like stories that touch the heart, that inspire, versus hearing a list of facts. Like an accrevent would want to hear a list of facts, but the facts don't matter to a sentient unless there is deeper meaning. They want to know why they should pay attention to what you're saying so they can understand the deeper purpose and have an emotionally inspiring reason <laughs> to learn. Now, regular sensory perceptions, their advantages are high emotional intelligence, where they really care about others, they're sensitive to others' needs, they're warm-hearted, and they can pick up on subtle emotional cues that would indicate a person's mood in a way that, say, somebody else wouldn't. Now, disadvantages of extreme types is they may feel overwhelmed in crowds because they're picking up on many people's emotions, especially negative ones that could weigh them down. And they may take on others' feelings and pain and not realize it. Others might consider them overly sensitive emotionally. So the extra sensory perception you may have heard about is clairsentience. They can feel what others are feeling, like they can enter an empty room and get a sense of the emotional residue left by the previous inhabitants. They're also known as intuitive empaths. They can absorb the energy of others to facilitate healing and can predict emotional outcomes in the future. So the best way to manifest if you're a sentient is to imagine being there emotionally already. Like if you want to manifest a trip to Hawaii, you would imagine emotionally how you will feel, like excited, at peace, happy, because you're on this great vacation. Also, stay connected emotionally while you imagine or conjure up all the good feelings you'd have when your goal is manifested. In other words, don't just be indifferent <laughs> when doing your manifestation work. So types of emotions where you find a lot of sentience are, say, massage therapist, body worker, healer, nurse, caregiver, dog trainer, anyone working with animals, you know, counselor, funeral director, social cause type person, mediator, someone in human resources, um, early childhood educator, nanny, senior caregiver, those kinds of caring or social support type of professions. So think about that for yourself. Does that feel more in alignment with your dominant style? And you might be noticing a bit of all of them in you, and that's good if that's true for you. In Heliotropus, the main character, Tia, is a sentient. She's very emotionally in tune with people, and that's why she chooses a role like coaching and inspiring others emotionally. And she can help heal people's emotional issues, and she can sense what's going on for people emotionally, even when they are unaware. And when picking up on people, say, in another density or dimension, she can't see them, but she emotionally senses their presence. Her disadvantages are that she's so overly identified with being a kind, compassionate person who helps others on their ascension path that it's an irony that she can't do it for herself so easily. She becomes blind to her own unintegrated shadow, the unkind, non-compassionate side of herself. <laughs> and so sometimes sentience can be a bit blind to emotional baggage that they have. So now let's talk about the importance of balance. So say you were to do the Tavis quiz and you're mostly sentient. You have a bit of tangent, decrevent, voyant, maybe no audience. So you're really kind of overbalanced in the sentient aptitude. And that's certainly how I was when I first started investigating this topic. But by investigating it, I was able to broaden all my abilities. And that's my suggestion to you. Try to get a balance of all of them so that the disadvantages of one style don't end up working against you. And so that anytime you want to manifest something, you are working from all the styles. Those are the master manifestors of the world. 
because if you overuse one style, they can create limitations in your life, can throw off the integrity of your whole body mind system. It's like driving a five cylinder car on only one or two cylinders. <laughs> So why are we strong in some capacities and not others? Is it nature or nurture? Well, it's a bit of both. Often there are limiting beliefs getting in the way of using all your manifestation styles. Now, a limiting belief is simply a piece of negative programming very deep inside your subconscious mind. And this kind of programming can negatively affect every aspect of your life from how successful you allow yourself to be in love, soul growth, friendships, career, physical, mental, emotional health. So think of it as a computer virus secretly working in the background. It's sneaky and it's hard to get rid of without the right guidance. And the longer you leave it there, the more damage it's going to do. But the upside is that the more you build these Tavis skills, the quicker and more powerfully you can get rid of these viruses and continually empower your whole body-mind system. And there's a growing body of complex psycho, spiritual, and neurological science that I've spent over 23 years studying. And with my partner, I've developed several powerful yet easy to use processes to break you free of these limitations through our Mind Story Coaching Academy to increase your capacities to create the life you want and not the life someone else wants for you. So as you may know, as children, our brains are extremely receptive, absorbing everything with no filters, everything we see, hear, feel, experience from our parents and teachers and bedtime books and cartoons and TV and movies. So before six years old, we don't have any filters to screen all that raw information out. It just goes straight into our subconscious. So all the repetitive messages we receive, good or bad, about money, relationships, life, who we are, what we can do, they all get embedded in our subconscious. And it's only after six years old that our brain starts filtering information. But by then, our subconscious has already been locked in. In other words, your childhood programming quietly controls your entire life. But we are all now developing the tools to release ourselves from those locked in programs. Now, I've experienced this for myself on a personal level. As I said, I was a very strong sentient manifester and very low in other styles. In retrospect, I see that I was born with this skill, but then of course overused it to survive and be helpful in a household where there was a lot of conflict. I saw that I could literally absorb everyone's negative energy and I would calm everyone down, but I was holding it all. I paid the price. So it was very hard on me physically, mentally, and emotionally. And I didn't develop the other aptitudes, the other manifestation skills until later in life. But the good news is I did learn to use this dominant sentient skill in a smarter way by helping others emotionally without taking on their negativity myself. And part of the way I did that was by developing the other four manifestation styles or aptitudes. So if you go to goldenagetimeline.com backslash free, or just go to the free tab on that site, you'll see how to do the Tavis quiz and how to get access to the re-inspired online masterclass where you can also get a copy of the Tavis ebook and quiz, the longer quiz. And these are free to take. And during this masterclass, you'll learn the tri-unity five-step process to give you a huge breakthrough on an area of life where you feel uninspired, where you've lost your motivation, where you know, say you're either lost in regret or disappointment or self-judgment or resentment or boredom or frustration or some kind of negative block keeping you from doing what you came here to do. And sometimes all it takes is tapping into these latent aptitudes, these superpowers to break through those blocks and finally free up all that trapped creative life force energy just waiting to be unleashed. And through these lockdowns, I think it's been frustrating for a lot of people who had some great things on the go and maybe had to retreat on a lot of things. 
So if you do the Tavis online quiz, which you'll see on the free tab at goldenagetimeline.com, and then you can take the re-inspired masterclass and you can finally get clear on what's next or what's in the way between you and manifesting an important life goal you have, whether it's in business, career, finances, life purpose, health, relationship, and no matter what your Tava style is, you can use this five-step trainity process to shift from bad habits of mind to good ones and dial up on all your aptitudes. And then you'll have this process to use whenever you need until the skills become a default empowering response to life and your success will then be on autopilot and it only takes a few minutes to do. Now you may have tried several ways to get rid of issues in your life and notice, heck, you're still frustratingly there <laughs> or you're only making small improvements and not the big turnaround you're hoping for. And there can be a lot of reasons for that, both personal and global. And we're gonna cover what those are and some of them may very much surprise you. <laughs> And if you've ever done any processes on removing limiting beliefs before, this one is different because just removing a limiting belief is like changing the oil filter on a car that's really ready for the junk heap. Or it's like removing a virus from a laptop that's so outdated that no new applications run on it anymore. <laughs> so here you'll discover how limiting beliefs are components, small components of larger entities called archetypal characters, self images, which are in turn components of even larger entities that we call mind stories and mind stories can be empowering or disempowering. They're like operating systems and yours might need an upgrade. <laughs> now, some people who've taken this masterclass, taken the quiz, start feeling like a dark cloud is dissolving from somewhere deep inside. And some start feeling this huge surge of self appreciation and feeling far more capable of taking on the world in a way they haven't felt in a long time. And some feel like a cork has been pulled out of their minds and there's this rush of creative intuition and clarity flowing through them. And people agree, all the thousands who have done this training, that the result is they feel something's changed, not just in the moment, but in the days and weeks and months that follow, whether it's in their quiet time, in conversations with others, in their meditations, or wherever. It starts showing up. Also in terms of results, things start showing up, ideas and possibilities start manifesting. So it's very exciting. I'd really love you to experience it. So just go to goldenagetimeline.com. You'll see events, free stuff, and our online courses and all that. So if you like this episode, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you get to hear about other episodes. And in the meantime, happy manifesting. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>